Hello, grab baggers. Oh, it's time for another session of Grab Bag, season four, episode five. Now they call that sound on here, the ringtone, night owl. That doesn't sound a bit like an owl to me. <clears throat> Maybe they have different kind of owls out in California that make weird sounds. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Hey, it's good to see you today. Although I really can't see you, but it is good to see you. And uh, we're going to go on, like I said, with season four. Episode five, John Ortberg wrote a book entitled, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat. Now, I don't think he said, if you want to walk on, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. And so keep that thought, and we'll get back to it in a minute, but I want to start my timer. There we go. Formal intro, welcome to Grab Bag Season 4, Episode 5. And actually, I'm writing this on February 25th, although I'm reading it on March 1st, one day after a 63 degree day, uh, but now it's back to winter, and you may remember that. Hopefully, however, by this time the video is released on March 28th, spring will have sprung and the birds will be singing like in a Disney cartoon opening. You know what I'm talking about? So please punch, poke, or otherwise designate your attendance by way of the misnamed button below. And that's what I mean, it's a, they say it's a button, but that's not any button like any button I've ever known buttons. Okay, so thanks at least for letting us know that you're participating. Last week, when we left our narrative, both Jesus and Peter got safely into the boat on the Sea of Galilee. Peter may have been spitting out water, you know, and, and he may have been drenching wet. Hmm, that does bring a question. Do you think Jesus got wet while walking on the water? Hmm, or do you think he had like special dispensation from the condensation and that he walked between the drops? Hmm, your call. Fortunately, Galilee is a freshwater lake and Peter would not have had sodium shock from his experience. And this is, I found this to be an interesting geographical fact, that Galilee is the lowest freshwater lake on Earth. And it's the second lowest lake in the world. The first lowest lake is the Dead Sea, which is a saltwater lake. And what makes those facts very interesting is that water from the Sea of Galilee flows down the Jordan River to the Dead Sea. Now, maybe you can figure out what I'm trying to figure out. That is, where, why, and how, at which point does that water flowing from the fresh water pick up enough salt that when it gets to the Dead Sea, people can float on it? And it's called the Dead Sea because, well, things don't live there because of the high sodium content. A man could drown in the Sea of Galilee, and yet a person can float on the sea or the Dead Sea. Hmm. I probably ought to go check that out, but not now. So, but let's use that to teach a lesson. And here's the lesson God provides a lake of refreshing truth. And Satan's job is to lead people down river and lower than what God provides. And as people do that, as they go down, so to speak, so to speak, in their spiritual commitment, sin will invade them incrementally. It'll be like salt coming into the water. You won't even know it's happening and it will deaden and eventually kill the soul. So, lesson is, it's best to stay upstream by setting our hearts and minds on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay, <clears throat> that's our lesson for today. It's been great being with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being... 
no, I'm just kidding. But I hope that that perhaps gives you a little bit of a challenge. Stay up in the freshwater lake. Don't drop down to where Satan wants you at the Dead Sea. I mentioned earlier that John Ortberg, Ortberg wrote a book he titled, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat. And that's a, that's a clever thought and logical, right? I mean, if you want to swim, you have to get into the pool. If you want to be a writer, well, you have to write. If you want to be a mechanic, you have to get your hands dirty. In other words, want to is not enough. There has to be follow through. All, after all, none of the other disciples got out of the boat. Maybe they wanted to walk on water too, but whether it was fear or their soaked clothes, whatever it was, it kept them anchored to their seats. Now, did you notice how I used that nautical term anchored? It was kind of in the motif, if you know what I mean. But only Peter. Peter was the only one who had the courage to ask and then to act. And so you have to applaud Peter's boldness and courage. He wanted to, but then he did. Want to is good, but it's just not enough. So it, it kind of throws us a curveball that if you want to stay with the fish metaphor, it's something that yanks our line. When we read that Jesus rescued Peter and said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I mean, we sit there and look at that. Wait a second. He's the one that got out of the water. And yet Jesus is saying, you of little faith. So let's look at this statement that we have hooked on our line. Okay, part, pardon the pun. Maybe that'll be the last of them. I don't know. I won't bait you anymore. <laughs> well, sorry. Okay. You of little faith. Little faith is a phrase that Jesus employed when speaking about quantity of faith. You know, we, like I got a little gas in the tank. I got a full tank. And so Jesus was not saying that you don't have any faith. He was just saying you have little faith. You have room to grow. So here's a question. Was he addressing only Peter when he made that statement, or was he also addressing the group? Did he speak loud enough for everyone to hear? Was he looking at the men in the boat while he was lifting Peter up from the water? And was he then asking all of them, you of little faith, why did you doubt? If Jesus was only addressing Peter, I think we can be assured that his words were still heard by everyone in the boat. Now, personally, I think he was addressing the whole group. And I will keep you in suspenders for now to tell you later why I think that. But speaking to the group or not, Peter was definitely within hearing range when Jesus said, O oh, you of little faith. When we read Jesus's response, and if you think he was speaking only to Peter, we feel for Peter. And we, we kind of think that, well, Jesus was rude or Jesus was mean, and he should at least have given Peter a pat on the back or a participation trophy for at least making an attempt and getting out of the boat, right? Well, first of all, we don't know all that Jesus said, okay? I mean, Mark records that statement, and he records that statement because Peter's the one who's telling him what to write down. But we don't know the whole conversation. We don't, we, I doubt, I personally, I doubt that that's the only thing Jesus said. Oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? And then he got in the boat. And then he just went silent. For the rest of the time. I don't think that was Jesus' only sentence. Jesus' response would have drawn some reflection, and I really think it, reflection on behalf of the disciples, but I also think it would have drawn some questions, some response from them, maybe even some pushback, some honest statements like, 
why are you being so rough on us? Or why were you being so rough on Peter? The, the kind of things that we may think when we read that statement. Hey, you know, they were men. They were they had heads on their shoulders and they had emotions. They, they might have been offended if that was all that Jesus said. You know, they could have said, Jesus, look, we aren't perfect. You are. But can't you just cut us some slack? So, sorry, that's another fishing reference, I guess. Cut us some slack. So, my point is that we don't know what teaching followed OU of little faith and the next seeming judgmental question about doubting. Maybe we need to look from another viewing angle. Oh, angle, that's another fish thing. Um, we all need prodding. Coddling, is that a fish reference? Coddling, cod coddling all the time just doesn't build character or teach growth. But let's look at what we know. We know that Jesus is the master teacher. Jesus knows a teachable moment like the back of his hand. Jesus not only knows these men, he loves these men. In fact, these are the men who are going to be responsible for the ongoing church when Jesus is no longer physically on earth. And the truth is, all he wants is to build them up, to grow them up, to toughen them up for the kingdom work that they have no idea is in front of them. And so even if we just look at that sentence and it kind of think, we think, well, kind of maybe Jesus was being the master teacher, being who he is, being that he loves these guys and has their best hearts and interests. Maybe Jesus knows they needed spurring on. They, they needed their doubt confronted. They needed to know that Jesus knew that they were doubting. Not only does Jesus love the disciples, the disciples love Jesus. And so they know that he is for them. And when someone loves you to the core, you know that what may seem to others as unjust is truly for your benefit and for your growth. Discipline may appear to somebody else as, man, that's just not right. But when you know the heart of the person who's disciplining you, that they love you and they want the best for you, then you know that when they discipline you, it's for your benefit and for your growth. When a parent disciplines a child, when a Marine trainer yells in the face of a recruit, he's not trying to kick him out of the Marines. He's doing what he needs to do to toughen them up. When a coach makes an athlete do extra work, the purpose is not to hinder, but to help. So Jesus's heart is right. His purpose is right. His method is right. Are the disciples' ears and attitudes right? Are they listening? Are they hearing Jesus? Are they understanding why? He may, he may seem somewhat rough on them. Well, that will all depend, won't it, on what they learn. You can only know if their hearts were receptive and right when you see what they learn from the situation. Are they going to get mad at Jesus and forget and turn around and walk away? Or are they going to stay because they know that he's in it for them? What will happen on the shore? I mean, right now they're out on the water. But what will happen when they're on the shore later will prove or disprove both the effectiveness of Jesus' teaching and the teachability of his disciple students. And not until the next lesson will we find out what happens when they're on the shore. So keep that thought in mind. By the way, do you remember what we learned about the word faith from the Greek word pistis? More than belief alone, faith includes obedience. Little faith, to some degree, is not a criticism. It's a recognition of potential. Peter displayed a small measure of biblical faith. 
and Jesus recognized it. Faith got him out of the boat. And if you want to walk on the water, ha -ha, you have to get out of the boat. So when Jesus was talking about little faith, he, he wasn't criticizing them and tell them they're useless and worthless. He was just simply assessing the situation, saying, you, you got potential. And I'm being honest with you. And we're in this together. And you're going to grow. And I'm can, helping you confront your doubt. Because that's the only way we get beyond it. So let's talk about that. Why did you doubt? Jesus asked. Matthew records Jesus asking that in chapter 14, verse 31. Now, if for some reason you and I get to, t -t -t -t, you know, and we arrogantly shake our heads about the disciples, these guys, they're with Jesus, and they, how can they doubt? Well, we re need to remember our old friend context. These guys are in a boat pitch black on a stormy sea. It's the end of the day and they're physically exhausted. They're thinking they saw a ghost that was not a ghost. That it ended up, miracle of miracles, being a man walking on water. And now they're watching another one of their friends step out of the boat in the middle of a storm. And anytime that's ever happened, if somebody got tossed out of a boat before, they died. And what if you're Andrew, Peter's brother, and you're in the boat and your brother steps out and you're thinking, you know, I wish I could scream. I mean, Andrew's thinking F-E-A-R brother's going to die. But then all of a sudden, look, he's walking on waves too. Yay, go Peter. And then, oh no, he's starting to sink. He's going to drown. Who's going to rescue him? See, when you get into their context, when you get into their boat, so to speak, and you start thinking like these guys, with the conditions in which they found themselves, and you try to imagine yourself in that boat with that storm going and that water thrown on you, and it's tossed back for it, and this guy stepping out of a boat, and you think you saw a ghost, how confident do you think you would be? <laughs> you know, it's easy sitting home in a nice dry place reading the Bible to think, oh, those guys. But I like the fact that the Bible's honest. And I tend to think that if that was me, Jesus would also be looking at me and saying, Rob, what? Why do you doubt? You have little faith. Why are you doubting? The Greek word translated doubt means literally two stances. Doubt is trying to stand in two places at one time, or it can mean going back and forth. James calls it being double-minded. He said, don't let that person who, who asks one thing of God and then doubts and, and turns away, don't let that person think they'll get anything from God because they're double-minded, trying to stand in two places trying to think the pro and the con, trying to walk the middle line, so to speak. You see, the disciples were what we call on the bubble. Jesus has been working with them, and the bubble was moving in the positive direction, but they were still doubtful about him, his purpose, and maybe even his divinity. Jesus's question about double, or about doubt, I'm sorry, points out a mental and heart issue in the disciples that Jesus is attempting to alter. Eventually, we know that the bubble will totally move in Jesus's favor, except for Judas, because these men will become martyrs for Jesus. But doubting men do not martyrs make. 
And Jesus has his work cut out for him with these guys. And I'll insert here that when we look to the end, I keep telling you, this is one of the most crucial points in Jesus' ministry. And when we look to the end of John chapter 6, we're going to find out that it really does come down to, are you staying or are you going? Jesus has his work cut out for him. And the you know, the confrontation, the point of no return is coming up very, very soon. And these guys are still on the bubble and they're doubting. And it'll be a bit until the bubble inside them moves totally in Jesus' favor. In case in point, Luke records that before Jesus' ascension, this is from the Gospel of Luke, um, while they were still talking, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. Again, thinking they saw another ghost. And you think, did they not learn their lesson? And Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? They were, they were doubting. In Matthew 28, 17, we read that when Jesus called the disciples after his resurrection, when Jesus got everybody together on a mountain, when they saw him, they worshiped him. Yay! But then Matthew writes, but some doubted. Remember doubting Thomas, who was very leery about believing Jesus' resurrection unless he had tangible and visible proof, you know, unless he saw the nail prints in Je Jesus' hand and could stick his hand in the scar wound in Jesus' side. He was, we call him Doubting Thomas. Now, of course, you and I, we live absolutely certain of all faith matters, don't we? <laughs> we live beyond the shadow of a doubt, right? What about when trouble comes? Do doubts arise? Absolutely. Sometimes we're going to do a grab bag about doubt. That, that'll be. Hmm. So here's a question for you. What were they doubting? Did they doubt Jesus' divinity? Were they doubting that they were the ones who could walk on water? Is that what Jesus was saying? Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You could have come out here and walked on water. What were they doubting? Did they doubt that Jesus would or could save Peter? Is that what Jesus was saying? Why did you doubt that I could save him? Did they doubt that Jesus wasn't a ghost? Did, Je did they doubt that Jesus cared about them and wouldn't let them drown? Why, why are you... Why did you think I would send you out here just to let you drown? Why did you doubt me? See, there, there are a lot of reasons that we could ask questions. Why did Jesus say that statement? What were they doubting? Jesus doesn't say specifically. And just as you thought it was safe to go back in the water. Well, that's a Jaws thing. Okay or safe to go back in the boat. We have these remarks from Mark. That kind of good. remarks from Mark. <laughs> right? Remarks from Mark. You know, if Mark was a preacher in like 20 years ago, and he had to write a weekly preacher's column in the church newsletter, he would have called it remarks from Mark. I think so. Say, hey, Rob, why don't you just stop the commentary? Why don't you just get back to business? Okay. So Mark wrote in chapter 6, verse 51, Then he, that is Jesus, climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. And this is kind of where I went, on the bricks because the other gospels don't mention what mark mentioned and remember mark is just simply 
reporting what Peter tells him to write. So this is Peter's recollection and understanding. He's saying, he's connecting the loaves with the doubt. Jesus, Jesus said, why did you doubt? And he got into the boat and then Mark says, the wind died down and they were amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their heart was hardened. Is Peter saying that the doubt involved the lesson from the loaves? That the disciples' doubt involved a lesson that they didn't learn from the feeding of the 5,000? What do the loaves have to do with anything? Bread was in the picture back before the storm with the feeding of the 5,000, but how is that connected with their crusty... Okay, see what I did there? Well, how is that connected with their crusty, hardened hearts? I can tell you what I think, and I guess that's why you're patient enough to, to listen. I think that Peter is reflecting as he dictates to Mark. I think Peter is connecting dots in retrospect as the Holy Spirit reveals truth through his past interactions with Jesus. And here is what I think Mark and Peter are telling us. The word translated hardened means insensible, dull, unresponsive, dense, lacking spiritual perception. Peter is admitting, I think, to a duh, dum, you know, duh moments. The disciples' minds were slow to grasp the truth behind what Jesus was doing or teaching in the feeding of the 5,000, in the walking on the water, in the calming of the storm. They were low on faith. And they were slow in understanding that these miracles showed Jesus to be God's son, the Messiah that they had awaited. Their hearts were not impenetrable titanium alloy hard, but they were concrete that required a long time for truth about Jesus to sink in. Do you remember what, we, what John's purpose is in this gospel? These things have been written that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I think what Peter was saying is we got to that point in the boat, and we still did not put all the pieces together and to, to, to just come to the conclusion that Jesus was saying to us, I am God. Look at what I'm doing. And they had little faith, and they doubted, and they missed Jesus' whole intent. Mark points directly to the bread as a misunderstood message that indicated the disciples' little faith, their hard hearts, and thus their doubt about Jesus. It's as though Peter is thinking, if we had understood Jesus' hidden truth in the miracle of the loaves, it would have boosted the levels of our faith and it would have minimized our doubts, but we missed it. We may see clearer today, that's you and me, we may see clearer today than the disciples saw, but we should not get arrogant about how perceptive we are, spiritually speaking. More truly than ever before is this adage, there but for the grace of God go I. Only through the disciples' failures, through them and us learning from their doubts and through the Holy Spirit's enlightenment, do we have a head start on spiritual lessons like the meaning of the loaves? You see that I keep, I know I keep coming back to it, but we need to keep remember, remembering that in retrospect, in the rearview mirror, we see Jesus much plainer than these folks did right up front, you know? How, how aware of the, the essentiality, whatever, of the Civil War were the soldiers on the battlefield fighting it? You know, we can look back and say, man, that, what Lincoln did and, and that war was just important for holding our country together. 
for making us a united states. I, they didn't see that. They just saw certain issues around them. They just saw somebody shooting and pointing at, pointing and shooting at them, and they had a fight. And in the same way, these disciples, they're living life. This is the Messiah, and they've been taught a, a misunderstanding about who the Messiah would be, what he would be like, and now they've got this guy who's doing these miracle things, and they're following him around, and they believe him, but yet at the same time, you know, they're, they're not going to, pardon the fishing pun again, take it hook, line, and sinker, and just jump after it. And so Jesus has to grow them. He has to grow their faith. So we do have a head start on understanding the bread because we're this far ahead and we have the scripture. We even have this account, this incident of Peter saying we didn't grab that meaning to cause us to say, uh-oh, we better grab that meaning. And so, okay, time for me to stop. I'm going to plow through here very quickly and then we'll be done. So it's only through the disciples' failure and through them learning from their failure and through us learning from their doubts, through the Holy Spirit's enlightenment that we have a head start on spiritual lessons like the meaning of the lows. And yet the fact is that we too often doubt, disobey and struggle with weak faith. Peter came to realize that the multiplying of the bread was more than a hunger relief project, that the miracles of Jesus were lessons, signs, signals about Jesus. The disciples were, in the gospel words, completely amazed after Jesus' walk on water and after the storm grows calm. But they wouldn't have been, I think Peter is saying, if they had understood what the miracle of the bread was saying about Jesus and about his connection to his Father, God. They wouldn't have been totally blown away because they would have known, look what he did with the bread. This is the Son of God. Why should we be surprised? Multiplying bread and feeding 5,000 was child's play to Jesus, as was walking on water and calming a storm. If they had understood the purpose of the bread, perhaps they would not have been afraid and would not have heard Jesus say, you have little faith, why do you doubt? We each have growing room for our faith. We each should pray that God will break up the hard ground of our hearts so that the water of his word and the seeds of faith will unite to bring a harvest for him in the kingdom. We should pray that God would give us courage and big faith to step out of our secure boats and step into the storms of life for him and with him, knowing that he will be near to rescue and save if necessary. So it's time to close. Bread connects the first part of chapter 6 with the final part. Coming up is, as I said, one of the most critical moments of Jesus' ministry. And every preacher can take courage in what's to come. Because Jesus' sermon on the other side of the lake empties the pews, vacates the church, so to speak. Truth is meant to be not all truth. Not all truth is meant to be heartwarming and gentle. Sometimes truth hurts. And when the truth hurts, how do you respond? That's what we're going to find out in our next lesson. Thanks a lot. And uh, take care, you guys. And thanks for hanging in there. And we're going to finish up John chapter six next week.